again. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Renewable Energy Technologies session. I'm, as you already know, I'm Antonio Galvez from r in Spain, and I, I'm, I'm the chairperson moderating, moderating this, this session. First of all, I'd like to, to mention something that may be of interest to you. Uh, it is that there is another workshop that contains papers on the same topic as this session. Uh, this workshop is not online. Uh, it is entitled Low TRL Renewable Energy Technologies, third edition. Um, this workshop starts today at, at 4 p.m., so after this session. I don't know if you are, if you can assist to those workshops that are not being uh, online, but if you have the possibility to, to attend to this workshop, I really, I strongly recommend you to, to attend. So, going back to, coming back to, to this session, as you can see in this slide, uh, this slide shows the, the agenda for the workshop. Um, there are 20 minutes allocated by presentation. And as you can see at the bottom of the table, uh, the, the question will be answered at the end of the, of the workshop. So starting with the, net, with the first paper, of the first title, uh, the first presentation is, a, is entitled Green Energy Project, a uh, Breakthrough Strong Energy Hard Visitor. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Abby Jingsbo from AMO, and the project is Green Energy Project. So time is due, Dr. Abby. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Antonio. I'm glad that all of all are attending here. That I'm thanking all of uh, the attendees here. And let me share the screen. Um, how was it before? Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the project is uh, green energy um, that uh, we won in with uh, Horizon. Uh, Sorry, uh, uh, hey, could you use the presentation mode? I'm in the presentation mode, yes. Okay, but we can see the the presentation mode. I mean, we are not, we cannot, we, we cannot no. see the, the slide in the full screen. Let's see again. Okay. Let's try again. Do you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, is it in present? Would you like me to go to presentation mode? Yes, if you don't have any problem, it is better to see the. Okay, do you see yeah. me? Do you see now? No. No, okay, let's go to this mode. Okay. Okay, now you see it. Yes, do you see it now? Uh, Antonio, no. do you see me? No, 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 we can see the presentation mode, but anyway, if you cannot change the mode, okay. Uh, okay. we can. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes, we can see you. Okay, go. Let's go ahead. Uh, not to waste the time. Um, thank, first of all, thanks the moderator, Antonio, and all the attendees today. And I would like also to thank um, Horizon uh, that grant um, our project. And I'll describe the project. Um, many years ago, I was puzzling um, why we are not using more the sun energy, which is the, one of the most uh, powerful energies on Earth. Uh, as you know, uh, during the 50s, um, Shokli Kwasia uh, stated that the, the, the theoretical efficiencies of uh, photovoltaic um, cells uh, around 33%. It, this is very low because when you start with a theoretical uh, limit, which is 33, practically you can go maybe to half of it 
or maybe less. And uh, if somebody will claim that, um, well, well, we have um, PV cells that are more than uh, 40, uh, maybe close to 50%, well, it's not uh, one layer. It's a multi-junction layer, but practically for commercial use, we are still in this region between 20, uh, 12 and 20%. Uh, but as we all know, when you start with 33% and you run it, um, you run you run it down to the load, you can even be more, even less than 14% or 20%. So you have to start high because it's not in a presentation mode, so you cannot see. The um, uh, this uh, this uh, slide running, but what we were looking for is to start I with a rectenna array. As all of us know, light is two um, two uh, two phenomena. For one, it's uh, it's a quantum. It's a quantum um, uh, uh, quantum energy. On the other end, like Einstein said. It's also electromagnetic energy. So if it's electromagnetic energy, you can um, you can capture it with an antenna and then convert it to um, to electricity. However, we are talking about um, very high um, frequencies and uh, it is a problem. It is a problem. And many, um, many uh, people in the last decade are trying to uh, convert light energy via antennas, uh, nano antennas. It was, it, no one was able to do it 50 years ago because the nano technology wasn't uh, mature enough. But today we are close to this technology to um, to make to make an application of a nano antenna and to capture the the sunlight with a nano antenna and rectify it. However, we are dealing with very high frequency as I, as I mentioned in the vision um, the vision region. We are take, we are talking between 400 to 800 terahertz. So um, we are talking on uh, if you can, we convert it to um, to the wavelengths, we are talking between 400 and 800 nanometer, which means you have to um, manufacture an antenna between 100 to 200 nanometer. Um, but when you do that, there is no efficient yet efficient way to rectify this um, uh, this energy. So this is a big gap. Uh, our project um, took um, a system approach, which, start, which starts with the architecture design, not only to have the antenna and the rectifier, but to think on um, the whole system. Um, so we, bought, we started with uh, system architecture design. Then we um, have a strong modeling group and design group to design the uh, rectifier and the antenna and also the overall system. Um, we uh, are based on two groups or which will um, um, manufacture the rectenna, meaning antenna and the rectifier together, because this is the main risk of the, um, of the project. And in order to uh, reduce the risk, um, we took two separate groups to do the, those um, rectennas. All the other parts are less riskier. Um, so um, it contains the energy storage, and the power management unit, and of course, integration. Our group consists of many, a uh, few universities and uh, research, um, research institute, 
around Europe and in Israel. Um, AMO, which I'm coming from AMO, uh, is the system design of the, of the overall system, of course, and the manufacture of the Rectena. Alto University in Finland, uh, they are the second group that are manufacturing the Rectena. Chalmers University in Sweden, uh, authorized to do the um, energy storage and the integration. And IHP Research Institute in Germany, uh, they are designing the circuitry. Udine University in Italy, and Kona University in Italy, uh, Noga Photonics from Israel, they are uh, the strong modeling group that we uh, put together and Cyprom is the management company. So all together we, uh, we start with the modeling and then build the rectenna and then uh, in parallel the energy storage, the circuitry and the overall, overall system will be integrated at the end of the project. Uh, here you have an overview of the objective of the um, of the overall system. So our aim is to develop a prototype and integrated system which demonstrates the harvesting of um, sun energy, uh, not 90% because we are in the beginning, we hope to get 20 to 40% of the energy to be converted. And, then, and this is only to start with. And I mean, this is the overall system uh, efficiency. So it's not compared to the 14 of the photovoltaic because in the, uh, when we are talking about photovoltaic, you start from 33 and when people are talking on 14 or 20% efficiency, they're talking only after the PV cell, not the overall system. Anyway, uh, we are using several computational tools in order to um, to uh, develop the uh, the uh, model and also to design the antenna and the rectifier. Um, the, those are the um, preliminary uh, outcome of the um, modeling and the first design. So we are talking on an antenna of 70% 70, 70 of um, efficiency. Um, excuse me, I went one back. Uh, we designed um, what we call the geometrical, um, uh, also a geometrical um, diode. Uh, it it's looks like a neck here. Um, and also what we call a ballistic diode and found out that the ballistic diode is much more efficient. Um, we were able to uh, demonstrate in the modeling around 70% of efficiency, but we designed from a practical practical um, uh, issues. We designed the first diode to give us 50%. So if you multiply uh, 70 by 70, you get 50%, but this is of course the model. When we'll get to um, the actual uh, component, I um, assume that we'll get maybe half of it. But to start with 25% or 20% or between 20 to 40, it will be a huge breakthrough. Uh, those are the, um, the uh, uh, output of our, our modeling uh, technologies. This is one of them. And here it's a comparison between a ballistic diode and um, a geometrical diode. As you can see the particles or the charges, uh, you have more, much more charges that flows uh, through this diode, uh, through the, the ballistic diode than in the um, geometrical diode. Therefore we abandoned the geometrical diode and we are going uh, straight to a ballistic diode. So what next? What next? Uh, First of all is to manufacture the ballistic diode and to do the measurement, to calibrate the modeling. And if we need to redesign um, the um, first articles, 
and then to put together the antenna and the rectifier, meaning a rectenna, manufacture them, measure them, and again calibrating the model. And from that point to go to design uh, several array op options of rectennas, uh, integ and integrate them all together with the overall system with energy storage, testing it, and again, calibrate the overall system model. Um, thank you all, and if uh, you have questions, Antonio said we will have it at the end of, uh, of the session. Thank you, thank you. I hope that, uh, one minute. Okay, I'm with you. Antonia, you are mute, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry. Sorry, thank you so much, Abby. I couldn't unmute myself. I don't know why, but the system was a bit slow. Uh, so yes, if you don't have any problem, I'd like to, to have the, all the questions together at the end of the workshop. Um, going to the second slot of, of time. As you can see here, the next the next you said uh, i have to uh, I, you said antonio that i have to uh, finish by uh, 220 so i uh, now it's 220, 220. So, yeah so right right now yes okay, so we are sorry. on time we are if on time you, <laughs> if you have any uh, are, are you going to to leave or no not yet are you going to wait for, for the, the end of the of the session Yes, yes, of course. I have uh, some okay. kind of uh, internet problems, but uh, I'll maneuver between two, two, um, two networks in order to be okay. online all the time. So if I'm uh, if I'm disappearing, I'll go come back again in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Sorry for that was, yeah. inconvenience. Thank you. And as Doctor. Uh, as we said, we are on time right now, not at the beginning of the session, but now we are on time. And so we can start with the second presentation, uh, which is entitled Beam and Digitaliz Digitalization for Renewable Energies, Beam to make renewable energy more sustainable. If I'm not confused, this uh, presentation will be presented by two speakers, one if Uber Monsu from NL, NL Green Power. And the second speaker is Giacomo Bergonzoni from Capgemini. Yeah. And this, this project, this presentation comes from, is part of the project IDCOM. So time is yours. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to, to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much, Antonio, and all the organizers of Sustainable Places 2023. Uh, this is my second time on this conference, and uh, it's a pleasure to me to be here another time. And uh, I'm today we are uh, we are uh, working we are presenting uh, the, the beam and digitization for renewable energies and uh, so the, the, the theme of the the beam uh, BIM to make renewable energies more sustainable today I'm not alone uh, I am Giacomo Bergonzoni I am a beam uh, beam manager senior consultant of Capgemini Engineering and uh, uh, also Hubert Monzu from Enel 
is uh, with us so who better you can uh, you can introduce yourself okay so okay he's going to to reach us later and uh, uh, so the, the 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 presentation is about uh, the beginning a uh, presentation of uh, of our of uh, of the of the project and and the uh, in general of of uh, Capgemini and the NL Green Power and the scope and goal of NL Green Power of the implementation strategies and uh, life cycle management uh, with the uh, BIM. So starting with the standardization, BIM for uh, design, BIM in execution, and over to uh, operation and maintenance. And in the end, in the end, uh, Hubert we will show you the BIM benefits. So how to define KPI and monitoring uh, time cost and SDGs. Uh, application uh, on a BIM project. Just a few words about Capgemini, that is a, a world leader about uh, consultancy in engineering and, and uh, research and development uh, topic with uh, at least, uh, more or less 3,000 uh, 300,000 people and uh, Capgemini Engineering is uh, 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 it's part of the group Capgemini and it, uh, formerly was Altran and now it's part of the group Capgemini and uh, Capgemini Engineering uh, is also spread uh, around the world uh, and working in all the industries from uh, product uh, system engineering, digital and software and industrial operations. Uh, this is a, a, a short presentation of energy group power. So, Bert, you can you can uh, show you can uh, present. Okay. Thank you. I I give you some fast information about Energy Green Power, that is a company of Energy Group that has a, that have as a scope the development and management of energy generation activity from renewable resource. We are present in 21 countries with 1,200 power plant in construction and operation, and we are in developing other five countries. Um, our power generation installed is over 59 gigawatt and include all the principal renewable technology. In Enel Green Power, I am in the unity of quality assurance and continuous improvement with the roles of BIM expert in engineering and construction department. Our scope it supported the activity of engineering and uh, uh, engineering and construction with the development of digital solution that can improve the quality of activity and reduce the time the time and the cost one of our goals is improve the BIM methodology in all activity of engineering and construction from business development to point them thank you Jack. thank you thank you and um we are going to 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 show how Enel decided to to uh, to implement BIM in, in their project. And uh, what is BIM? It's uh, in few words. It's uh, the digitalization in the construction industry. And uh, as uh, like a consultant in Capgemini Engineering, we support uh, Enel uh, Enel in this journey. And the start point of this journey was uh, to define a strategy using uh, some tools that uh, we uh, we developed, and uh, so the, the first uh, is to define the, the main area uh, areas in, in which uh, is important to to work when implement BIM. So ICT process and management uh, training and development of new standards. And um, we define a BIM, a BIM maturity assessment to define what, what which is uh, the, the as is uh, 
state uh, of the art of BIM in in the in the um, uh, in the NL, and then uh, a lot of uh, uh, a way to to define the way to to go to the full beam uh, full beam approach in a multi year roadmap uh, defining the, the, the different uh, uh, activities in the different uh, stream uh, like ICT uh, administrative and managerial system and training and change management uh, uh, big stream to to take uh, to. <coughs> to take over and um this is was the first approach that is was um, that was most waterfall and then uh, we just uh Anna decided to to go in a more agile way to to implement this uh, methodology and we are working in agile right now and um the uh when we implement uh, uh, this methodology uh it, it's very important to standardize and also the reason why also there is the, the quality uh uber that is in the quality team because uh the standardization is uh, the, the the first step uh, uh to implement beam because uh, we need uh, standardized data to uh to take value from a bim model to the digitalization so we developed the um uh, we develop a, a common and shared language based on a, a classification system that is uh, created uh, customized to the uh, with the, the needs of enel uh, and uh, was created to tag and classify all the type of, of the object with uh, about um, uh, about the information of asset uh, of uh, the, the pro reference project and uh, the type of product uh, and the activities and the the, the construction phase uh, in which is uh, and the phase in which uh, we are and uh, so with this classification system it's possible to to share the information and talk in the same language of all the system of the different departments and this is um, the, the core of the structure of classification system that they talk about essentially of, of product each product as a wbs so is a as a structure of a, a sum, from a sample component to to the part and then uh, we have uh, different categories uh, systems and assets at, at the end we have also tasks uh, that uh, can be related to specific products and using this uh, classification system composed for uh, from uh, 21 uh, fields uh, it's possible to to talk with uh, operation and maintenance so with the sap system to uh, exchange um, uh, as expediting a logistic with um, uh, engineering, construction, planning, uh, and quality assurance to all the quality tests on site. Uh, so the, the, the approach in, in NL Green Power of Beam is a, a life cycle approach. So there is a system integration through, through the life cycle of the uh, digital life on our assets uh, and that this data uh, go um, go across different uh, system and different uh, softwares uh, and and tool and so the 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 to have a, a, a common shared language is a is a is the key to 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 uh, reach uh, this uh, system integration and uh, uh, so we have different uh, scale of project and uh, we do um, we starting uh, with the, some tools that helps uh, the, the designer to work to, to work with BIM and to put the right information in the right way with the right data model inside the BIM model 
also to put information about uh, the uh, con uh, the um, electrical connection between the element and they give a structure that can be used for design validation and also for um, uh, end over to end them. And then put all the data in a CDE, so in a shared place with all the data of the, uh, of the project, with document, with BIM model, and then the, the, the designer will, will put the, their model in this place uh, and the, the BIM coordinator of ANL we will use uh, uh, the BIM model to do the checks uh, and to do uh, to to ask to correct uh, on the funny issue to the client, and then uh, we have uh, here the Aveva oh, the Aveva um, uh, platform. Okay, I see that you see a little bit in uh, late. So the Aveva platform uh, that is. Uh, uh, the platform when uh, it's possible to to sh to see all the information about the um, the BIM model to see the BIM model so all the BIM model of the all the project and uh, also uh, define uh, see all the properties and also do a um, transcodification so a mapping of data of the data that are important for. Uh, for the functional location of um, SAP for um, operation and maintenance. So this is an overview, a quickly overview. And now a little bit uh, in depth, uh, we see uh, we see here that uh, actually the ecosystem of of uh, common data environment in NL is a pretty big because starting from uh, out of this construction cloud. Uh, for collaboration uh, phase, for collaboration activities, uh, as through open text to uh, to document management system and to uh, Aviva for uh, all the data management inside the BIM model. Mm, and here you can see all uh, um, all the data uh, that are standardized inside the BIM object in this case of a solar a solar fields of solar plants and uh, uh, not only for for the equipment but also for um, for wire uh, on the building and also was uh, developed a library a standard libraries for different assets uh, like for a wind uh, plant warehouse solar plant warehouse best warehouse and so in this way, oh, the, the supplier and the partner of Enel can use this library like a starting point with already the data model implemented to work inside the beam authoring tool and develop the design in a proper way. Um, also, we, we test a VR environment, uh, the possibility to put our BIM model and they show the information and see the information in a more realistic and immersive environment to enable also new use cases. And during the execution, we have the possibility to, uh, to extract uh, data from the IM model for, uh, to, for the construction site, so to to give uh, information to create a, a Gantt chart, so schedule, and also uh, to, uh, to um, monitoring the cost of the project. And also we use uh, um, ACC for collaboration, so to uh, define uh, issues on, on the model, to define if there is uh, some any problems um, on, on the problem and uh, communicate these uh, issues to the construct uh, the, the um, APC contractor or to, to the, the designer to solve it. And at the end of the process, uh, there is uh, the endeavor to OEM with this uh, possibility to take the information in uh, from the BIM as built model um, that is. Uh, uh, delivered at the end of the construction from the partner that is uh, ingested by Aviva and uh, mapped uh, all the data that need to SAP uh, 
uh, AIM to to be um, to be in a in an asset management uh, system uh, to to do the, all the activities of operation and maintenance. This is the structure that is uh, uh, automatically created from the data, um, the the information of the BIM model from uh, from uh, Aviva to uh, SAP. Uh, the end is just a, a quick video of uh, uh, the life cycle beam in energy power. So the, uh, just a show reel of what uh, is possible to do with the BIM model uh, for uh, renewable energies. Uh, you see uh, the possibility to, to take information about uh, solar plant, uh, about uh, all the elements and also uh i see that is not uh, really <coughs> but uh, also you can see here the substation um bim model and also you can see uh you just saw plant uh, developed with uh, in a in, for, for uh, define all the all the information in the geometries to to track the um the progress of the construction site and in the end uh, we can put all this data inside a gis uh, uh, system to see our bim model inside a territorial context so i give uh, uh, the floor the stage to to uber to the last part of this presentation that is about benefits of bim okay thank you giacomo I give you a faster overview of all the benefit uh, discount uh, up to today. Uh, one of the most important benefit uh, of the BIM methodology is the single source of true, uh, automating, uh, automating the recovery of data and their transfer to other supply chain partners up to the final user that must manage and maintain the work. Okay, we can go to the next. Uh, thanks to this method, we can reach many saving in the engineer, in the activity of engineering and construction phase, but can reduce the time for the control check and process the document. We can reduce the disalignment between different documents, and uh, we, had, we have also seen that we can reduce the capex sector risk and the extra cost of a little percentage for, for the moment. Please the next. Okay. Uh, also in construction phase, uh, we have uh, other uh, benefit uh, from uh, the, the, the reducing time for setup of different tool and better manage the transmission of many um, data between uh, these tools. Okay, the next. Uh, also in phase of uh, O&M, we have achieved other benefit during the activity of Endover because we have developed one automatic system of transcode for all the code and function allocation for OM activity. The last. <clears throat> okay, here we have one overview of the benefit of sustainable that we have reached. The, the, the first three benefit but we can see in uh, this slide, improve the quality of the project and uh, the life of uh, the participant, while uh, the last free benefit improve the quality of the life uh, on site and, and the near, near the site of construction and reduce the consuming of natural res resources. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to to thanks uh, a lot, uh, Hubert, and for all the energy power uh, people that work uh, possibly to reach uh, better results uh, and the uh, innovation and digitalization in the construction uh, industry. Thank you, you. Thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. Giacomo and Hubert, and um, yeah, and the question will be answered at the end of the of the workshop, as I already said. 
so we can go to to the third title that the system is quite as low right Can you see my screen? Okay, so the first time slot is for the development of, of the paper entitled Electromechanical Upgrading of Industrial Bioliquids. The project is a uh, EBO from the uh, Horizon 2020 project. The speakers is Roman uh, from Sintef. So Roman, time is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good, perfect. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I will present eBio, a project that has been run for 30 months now. Um, it's going to be a bit more fundamental on, on, the, uh, on the topic. Um, but uh, I hope uh, you find it uh, interesting. So uh, I guess we all can agree that renewable energy and biomass will be in one way or the other, the, the belong to the main pillars of, of a future society. Um, in which way this, at least the biomass that still has to be seen, um, how they are at the moment connected um, is in a very traditional way. You use renewable energy to produce hydrogen, <clears throat> and then that hydrogen is used to upgrade certain fractions or intermediates from biomass uh, in, a, in a standard chemical process where you use high pressure, uh, temperature, a catalyst, uh, very similar to the, to the fossil-based uh, chemical uh, processes. Um, what we aim for is to directly use the electricity to apply electrochemical uh, conversions of, of biomass-based uh, uh, intermediates. So you don't go all the way to the hydrogen and then high pressure and so on, but you try to apply directly the, the electricity uh, electrochemical cells and uh, react your bio-based molecules uh, uh, in that way. Um, as bio liquids, we use the ones that are at, uh, at this stage at industrial scale. One of them is black liquor. It's an uh, intermediate of, of pulp mills. It's a liquid which is very uh, basic. It contains uh, the lignin that you extract from wood in order to produce fibers. Uh, that liquid is not, let's say, commercially available, but it's available inside the pulp mill. The other one is the um, pyrolysis liquid. Uh, that's uh, a liquid that is produced by very fast uh, heating of, of uh, biomass. Uh, you break down the, the structure of, the, of your bio-based polymers and produce an uh, oil liquid uh, emulsion that you can later upgrade to, to fuels and chemicals as well. Um, we do not necessarily aim for, for a, let's say, complete conversion into hydrocarbons, uh, uh, high value uh, chemicals, but we rather aim for a stabilization, uh, improvement of the properties, energy densification in order to make the, the later process uh, uh, of further uh, conversion uh, easier. Uh, and in that sense, we go for, for the oxidative depolymerization of the lignin and the cellulose uh, based molecules and on the cathode side, we go for uh, hydrogenation uh, in order to uh, improve the, the, the properties of the, of the components. I will come back to that in a, in a minute with more details. So I'm not sure how much you know about electrochemistry. To make it very simple, uh, we use the, the, the example of water splitting um, on the left side. In a very, very simple fashion, you can say water goes in, oxygen and uh, hydrogen go out, produced at, uh, at the electrodes by, by splitting of your, of your water molecules. Um, now, the hydrogen is what you want to produce. The oxygen is not uh, uh, really useful. 
um, for, for anything. So a lot of people look into other conversion routes on the on the anode in order to uh, uh, not to produce the oxygen, but something which has a, a higher value. And uh, that could, for example, be uh, converting lignin into into oxidized uh, monomers. Um, in our case, we ideally would like to have both the anode and the cathode to convert our bio-based components. But um, we know that a complete selectivity towards those, meaning that we produce almost no hydrogen is, is, uh, is not realistic. So we um, take also the production of hydrogen into consideration and, and uh, that can then be used as fuel or um, as a um, reducting uh, agent or whatever um, in the chemical process. Um, in general, the advantages of, of running electrochemical conversion of, of biomass or, or uh, uh, chemical uh, components is that you can work at, at rather mild conditions. You compensate uh, the temperature and the pressure by your applied potential. Uh, you, by using your, uh, your potential and the electrode materials, the electrolyte, you have uh, additional degrees of freedom, but of course also your, your process becomes more complex. Um, in general, the operation of such a unit is, is not uh, too difficult, at least uh, the, when it comes to the, the safety uh, issues, it's, it's much simpler than, than running a high pressure uh, uh, reactor. Um, issues are that you use the electrodes as your, as your catalytic uh, surface area, so you are limited uh, in that. And um, as I said, the decrease of freedom also lead to, to more uh, complex mechanisms. You have um, reaction going on at the surface of the electrode, in the electrolyte, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so the, the three target reactions we go for um, are very similar for, for the black liquor and the pyrolysis liquid cases. Um, we aim to depolymerize the lignin, so to break the lignin structure down into, into smaller units which then can be easier uh, uh, further converted or can be distilled. Um, the main target groups are the, the ether bonds between the, the aromatic, uh, let's say, monomeric units. Then we also aim to convert uh, any uh, organic acids into either alcohols, uh, ethers, or... Um, uh, where do we have it? Uh, hydrocarbons. Um, this is very important because the acids are very much the catalysts for degradation of those bioliquids. So if we can remove the acids, then the stability of the bioliquid will be become uh, much higher. In addition, if you have emulsions, like in the case of uh, pyrolysis liquids, removal of the acids makes the separation of the water and uh, the oil phase uh, easier. Then this, the third um, target reaction is basically to reduce aldehydes um, of, of sugars or sugar-based uh, uh, derivatives into polyols. And that again improves the, the stability of those uh, molecules and uh, minimizes the, the repolymerization uh, degradation um, caramelization and so on in, in later steps. And the project itself is uh, at this stage um, in the process of setting up uh, electrochemical uh, chemical systems at uh, TL4. So we have uh, done the, the fundamental research. We understand more or less what's happening in our uh, uh, electrochemical cells. And now we, we set up a, a continuous systems in order to produce sufficient amounts for, for a co-processing test at, uh, at refineries. Um, we have all the, the support um, tasks uh, starting from the, the process design, economics, LCA, and, and so on. And um, we also include some societal impact uh, assessment. Uh, I will come back to that uh, a bit later. Um, the partners basically range from feedstock suppliers, 
um, pulp mill uh, companies, pyrolysis unit uh, um, developers via electrochemical uh, uh, electrochemistry research groups. Then we have the, the um, electrochemical cell producers, electrode producers, uh, refinery. CSIG is, is an institute that works a lot in the refinery business. And then we have the, the again, um, the ones or the end users that will apply our, our monomers towards their specific process of fuel production or, or uh, resin production. Um, as I said, we work a lot uh, with the electrode materials. Here you see some, some boron of diamond, which is a very stable material and, and is used more and more for electrochemical oxidations. Um, it produces radicals that can then react with your, um, with your uh, target molecules. And here you see a small scale setup, uh, having a cell, uh, some pumps. Uh, so that was uh, the type of setups we have used in the last uh, two years to, to uh, get a clue about the, the process and the reaction conditions uh, to be used. So now we move from this small uh, cells to a somewhat larger cell. It's about 10 by 10 centimeters uh, electrode uh, area and work also on the improvement of the of the electrode shapes in order to uh, increase the conversion and minimize uh, any degradation, cork formation, uh, deposits formation and so on. Uh, we use quite some heavy uh, analysis tools um, mainly because of the complex nature of those uh, bioliquids. Um, so the processes then uh, are, are, or the integration of those electrochemical processes in the, in the mother process would be for the pulp mill to separate a stream of, of black liquor from the, from the liquor cycle, run it through an electrochemical cell and separate then the, the uh, monomeric components. Everything which is still in, in a polymeric uh, state goes then back to the liquor cycle and is uh, normally or used in, in, a, in a standard fashion uh, in, the, in the pulp mill. Uh, for the pyrolysis liquid, it's a bit simpler. We basically produce the pyrolysis uh, liquid. Um, initially, we thought we can directly run it through a cell, but now we uh, um, have decided to rather do a fractionation of the water fraction, the acids and the, the lignin fraction and run them uh, separately through the electrochemical cells, mainly because they use quite or they, they need quite different um, conditions. Um, and the target reactions are also actually uh, different. Um, once that works out, then we uh, uh, will produce an upgraded pyrolysis liquid, which then can go to further uh, catalytic upgrading, um, either in a co-processing mode or in a standalone uh, mode towards uh, uh, fuel and uh, fuel components and chemicals. Um, as I said, that's where we are now. Um, we uh, are in the process of producing our first couple of liters of uh, upgraded bioliquids, and uh, then we will add some catalytic steps and, and then uh, do the, the co-processing at the uh, Tweetbosch and uh, CSIC. Um, we have also tested some uh, possibilities of uh, using uh, intermittent electricity. Um, basically, it can work. So you, if you have, uh, uh, let's say, solar panels, uh, they don't produce any electricity during the night. Um, you. Uh, you would need to have a small potential at the electrodes in order to avoid degradation. So you cannot uh, uh, really switch off the, uh, the, the, the electricity or, or stop, uh, remove the potential entirely. You need a small potential, otherwise uh, your electrodes corrode uh, very quickly. But if you can enable that, then you can uh, really go up and down with, uh, with the potential to, to run the conversion faster or, or uh, uh, slower. Um, as I mentioned, we, we also have a, a societal impact uh, assessment as part of the project. And uh, for that, we have chosen a Norwegian region, which is called Inlande. 
that's a region with a lot of biomass resource. Um, it's a region which has a lot of attention when it comes to uh, creation of jobs. Um, at this stage, you don't have much of industry there. You have uh, you have sawmills. They produce as a waste product uh, sawdust, and this sawdust is uh, currently transported to Sweden, and in Sweden it's used um, um, for for the pulp. So the idea is to uh, come up with some cases of setting up uh, such an uh, um, pyrolysis and uh, electrochemical upgrading process in that region to produce the, the stabilized bioliquids that can be then further transported to to some refineries for for uh, further upgrading and, uh, and polishing. Um, thank you for your attention. That's the, the consortium uh, picture of the last uh, uh, project meeting. And if you have any questions, just contact us. Uh, this, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And, say, and thank you very much for being on time too. Uh, okay, we can go to the last presentation. Sorry, I'm going to share my screen again. The last present presentation is entitled X Rotor and X Shaped Radical Offshore Wind Turbine for Overall Cost of Energy Reduction. The speaker will be William late it from the University of Star Cycle and the project is entitled Exerotor. So time is yours, William. William, are you there? Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about an EU Horizon 2020 project called uh, the X-shaped radical offshore wind turbine for overall cost of energy reduction. Um, the partners in this project are the University of Strathclyde. Um, Sorry, representing. Please. Uh, there's uh, there's um, we can't see your presentation. University College of Cork in Ireland. Uh, there's NTNU from Norway. There's TU Delft from Holland, Sorry, the please. Netherlands, and uh, Center from Spain, and uh, GE uh, Sorry. Renewables. We can see your presentation. You are you are sharing a, a message, another window. Now, the concept is very radical indeed, um, as you can see from this video. I hope you're seeing it. There's an no, animation. Uh, so I hope you're seeing Bill, that animation. Can you hear me? Um, and uh, Bill, Bill, it, hello, Bill, yeah. Bill, can you hear me? Hello. We can't see your presentation. We you are. We can. We can see your presentation. We can see. We 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 are watching uh, your email. So you can see yeah. it. So you, you can't can. see the presentation. No. We can't see. We oh. can't. I'll try. Yeah. I'll try. I'll stop sharing and try again. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Right. Is Okay, um, how are we doing now? Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, I'll start. There you go. There, there's the, the first slide, um, and uh, which I won't re talk, I won't talk in. And th this, is the, this is what the concept looks like as a, as a little animation. Um, the uh, and it's very different from the turbines that everybody's used to, with uh, you know, with basically a, a tower and a cell at the top and a, a rotor which rotates in a vertical plane. Um, 
if you'll notice, there's a, a very large main rotor which is rotating about a vertical axis and uh, small horizontal axis rotors attached to the lower half of the of the, the large blades. Um, now, the motivation for looking at this was that we're moving forward uh, in the development of wind turbine into more inhospitable um, environments. In, from the UK perspective, we've got targets of 50 megawatts of uh, offshore wind. Uh, and the target is for achieving that is 2030, which is just not far away. Uh, and a lot of this development is going to be into deep water, you know, far from shore, 100 kilometers from shore, or, and so on. And many aspects um, of the, the, the cost of energy, the components that work into the cost of energy, are, are weighted very differently than for uh, the more traditional turbines, either onshore or close to shore. Um, so it was, I, I kind of thought it might be an idea just to start from scratch and take these new circumstances into account and see where the, the logic of trying to to come up with a turbine which brought the cost of energy down um we'll just see where that took us so um what we have here is um just a you know, uh, a little um you know uh, um a, a simple oops sorry my the, you know that um, you know just pointing out that there's uh, two upper blades and two lower blades uh, on the vertical axis part, and that rotates in a horizontal, as I around a, a, a vertical axis as shown. The upper part of the blades are, are pitchable. The lower parts can are attached to uh, small secondary rotors, and these are where the power takeoff is. There is no power takeoff at the center here. The whole, whole purpose of this um, X-shaped rotor is to simply drive these um, uh, secondary rotors very fast into the, the wind to, to create a very large relative wind speed. And it's such a large wind speed that you don't need a gearbox and you don't need large multiple generators, uh, generators just a simple conventional generator uh, um, directly at, um, connected to these small rotors. Um, so uh, the obviously, um, uh, you know, the underlying rationales already me mentioned is, is is well is just a general look at bringing bring down the cost of energy. But but it's an you can look at it from the perspective of it's to overcome the inherent disadvantages of, of vertical axis wind turbines, or as to enable uh, efficient um, power takeoff by the secondary rotors. Um, I, I will. Uh, follow the, the first of those rationales. I could have done this talk the, the other way, but you know, there's some pictures here showing of different vertical axis concepts over the last, well, as you can see, 30 years. Um, all of these I've had a, a involvement in. Um, and there's a couple of things that uh, me, the lessons I learned very much from being involved in these is that the drivetrain costs are always very high. And that's primarily because they, they rise inversely uh, with the rotor speed. Um, and uh, for uh, vertical axis wind turbines, the, the, the rotor speed is lower than for a horizontal axis wind turbine. So inevitably, you're getting very large, uh, very fast increases in the costs of, of, of drive trains, you know, generators and gearbox. Um, and as the turbines get bigger, that problem gets worse. The other problem with them is aerodynamic efficiency tends to be lower than, than for horizontal axis wind turbines. So in terms of high drive train costs, you know, the, the main point here is that the is secondary rotors, these very small rotors, to give you some idea that their diameter for a five megawatt machine is about uh, nine meters, so 9.5 meters to be a little bit more precise. So these are very small rotors, so they rotate very fast. And that means you don't need a gearbox or a fancy 
generator. They're also, because they are, they are very simple power takeoffs, um, that they are very high efficiency, you know, approaching 99% of energy conversion at that point there. So the, the, this, the, so from this logic, we are, and if we if we want to um, scale up this wind turbine, we simply, um, you know, all, all we're doing is we can just add on um, more of these secondary rotors. So it's a linear increase in cost with um, with the size of the turbine for the power takeoffs. And by the time you get to five to ten megawatt scale, that become, converts into a very large cost saving. How about lowering the aerodynamic efficiency? Well, that's done through the, the shape of the, the rotor a little bit. In a way, it's a little bit of a cheat because um, the, what we do is, go, you know, the standard vertical axis is this sort of its shape. But by putting, you know, slanting the, 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 the blades, you get a bigger swept area for uh, the same physical size of blades. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, it's not quite as simple as that because the, the aerodynamic efficiency comes down a little, but the swept area increases much faster. So there's some angle at which uh, you've got an optimum choice. Um, it, by putting the, the coning angle on these blades, it also increases the tip speed ratio, which actually means that the wind speed that the secondary rotors will see will be higher than on an itch rotor. So, um, so for by simply changing the geometry, we've effectively increased energy capture and so compensating for the reduced aerodynamic efficiency. So that's um, you know. However, this concept has a potential problem in the sense that you are um, you've got several energy conversions. You've got the first of all the prime the, the first the, the the primary rotor as we call it the big x shaped rotor it's um it's uh, it, you know, that first of all captures power from the wind uh and uh so there's a a, a conversion factor there uh, uh you know the the that power is captured uh, in in terms of um uh, and creates the uh, high relative wind speed effectively for the secondary rotors, and you've got a second power conversion there. So you've got power conversion between the primary rotor and the secondary rotors, and before you you have to have the, the final power conversion with the, the generator. Um, now, for a conventional design of these secondary rotors, um, the efficiency of that would be typically about you know two thirds, uh, you know. Um, and that is purely coming from the aerodynamic characteristics. Is this odd ratio here? It's the ratio of the the the, the uh, it's the power aerodynamic coefficient and the uh, the, the thrust uh, coefficient. Um, and for conventional designs of, um, of of wind turbines, that's about 0.67, and that's too low. We're throwing away a third of the power we've captured by the primary rotor. Um, but however, you, you that's based on designing, uh, conventionally you design a rotor to maximize the power for a fixed radius of, of, the, the, of the rotor. But you can take an alternative approach, which would be to maximize power with a fixed uh, root bending moment. And that the outcome of that is that that ratio is higher. It goes up to about 0.8. Now, of course, the, the thing that matters here is the thrust is a bit different from the, 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 the bending moment, but it's related to it. So um, the key uh, um, aspect of the, these designs for these uh, with, with this high ratio of, of CPS to CTS is to have what we call low induction um, gen, um, rotors. So the, this points us in the direction of designing um, a, a rotor, low induction rotor to specific to specifically maximize this ratio. So we, you know, so, um, so we can uh, improve this first power conversion from the primary rotor to the secondary rotors by a uh, um, you know, very non-conventional design of the secondary rotor. Uh, there's another thing that's interesting, of course, because if the, whereby you get extra energy capture, 
whereby if you think about it, the, um, the secondary rotors go into and out of the wind, so they're seeing a, a sinusoidally varying wind speed. Um, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to dwell too much on the mathematics of this, but basically what the, that sinusoidal variation of, of, of the wind speed um, um, enables you to do is to increase the, the power by this factor here. It, you, um, it's three halves the inverse squared of the, the tip speed ratio for the primary rotor. Um, and uh, But the thrust is only increased by a third of that, it's a half. Uh, the, the inverse square of, of that um, tip tip speed ratio. Now that that can be that's quite significant because supposing we choose this lambda p to be five, the increased power you're going to get is about four percent. Now that's what you would achieve during you know in below rated wind speed. But as you go to higher wind speeds, that extra power increases as shown uh, in in, this, in the bottom bullet point. You know, the, the increase, let's say that uh, you, you, we, we, we hit rated wind speed about 10 meters per second, then you're going to have 4% extra energy capture there. It increases to 6% at 12 meters per second, 10% at 16 meters per second, and 16 at 20 meters per second. Okay, you can't actually exploit all that, but you can, on average, increase the energy capture by about six to eight percent. So you're getting something essentially which is going to cost you nothing there. So you put all those little bits and pieces together about the efficiency, uh, that um, you actually are able to design. Um, or, you know, this, this concept could potentially be as effective and as, as efficient as extracting power from the wind as a conventional wind turbine. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, um, so, we're, so we've met that sort of requirement whereby you want to, um, uh, you know, um, have a, a highly efficient tur um, uh, version of a vertical axis turbine which overcomes its natural aerodynamic drawbacks. Okay, now unfortunately, there's a whole trying to design this. Uh, you've got you because you've got two rotor, two sets. You've got the primary rotor and you've got the secondary rotors. Um, and you want to um, have the secondary rotors rotating fast enough to avoid needing a gearbox. Um, there's a whole lot of constraints. Some are, there's a whole bundle of constraints which arise from the aerodynamic considerations for your secondary rotors. There's another um, bunch of uh, constraints that arise from the generator and power electronics considerations. And also there is um, the, from the, the power conversion um, uh, efficiency consideration, there's a, a very large constraint, basically try and make CPS over CTS as large as possible. But there's other, um, uh, constraints which you, you you know there's upper and lower limits on the secondary uh, um, uh, rotor radius and their power rating and so um, upper and lower limits on the primary uh, rotor um, uh, power rating. So the, the question arises um, can we find a, a design solution which meets all those constraints sensibly? Um, well, yes, we can, but we find that these secondary rotors have to be rated at around 2.5 megawatts. You can't make them bigger than that, and you can't make them much lower than that without ending up with a, an inefficient solution. So uh, this is just an example from you know, initial um, explorations of this idea where we're trying to find, can we find a solution? And you, you see we can here because uh, we find a solution where we have got about a, a 5.9 megawatt um, rated power with a design tip speed ratio of about 4.9, which is, which is um, you know, the benefits of having the X rotor shape. If we had an X rotor shape, we couldn't have achieved that sensibly. Um, and we've got a, a maximum power coefficient of, of 0.39. For the secondary rotors, we, 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 we've got two of them. To, to, um, and uh, their design tip speed ratio is 3.27, uh, 
which gives you the right ratio that you want because the power coefficient is 0 0.27. Um, uh, and the thrust coefficient is 0.33, roughly. And we have five blades, so it's, these 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 rotors are very unusual. So all, all the, the 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 message to take away from this is that yes, we can find a solution, but the, the before we 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 you know that the the state of the art, um, this was way outside the state of the art for the aerodynamics for a wind turbine, and for the design of the blades uh, and the structural design of blades and, and everything else. So we had to do an awful lot of basic work to develop the, the necessary engineering science on this. But we've, we've made reasonably good progress on that to date. Um, the, the, you know, this is just showing a little bit of some details here, but I'm not going to go into that for brevity um, on this. OK, but I just to talk a little bit about the CapEx. OK. So what we've identified is potential, uh, this is capital expenditure, you know, the capital costs, some savings in comparison to conventional turbines that, um, that if you uh, look along the, 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 this um, histogram is showing for three different, there's four different uh, concepts for uh, horizontal axis when turbines are considered. Um, uh, what's called a three-stage defig, a three-stage permanent magnet generator, a two-stage permanent magnet generator, and a direct drive permanent ma uh, magnet generator. And you can see the cost savings there. For the three-stage defig, it's about 5%, but that rises to about 30% for the direct drive PMG. So, um, so that there's good potential here for re reduction in the capital cost. For OPEX, operational costs, and, and um, that uh, there's several um, aspects of this, which is really um, very advantageous for offshore turbines. We don't have high heav um, um, heavy components at high lift. You know, typically, direct drive generators or gearbox and generator combinations they are about several hundred tons, and they're about 100 meters above the sea. Now that makes access to components um, and for repairs, you need to have heavy lift vessels, um, and you need to be able to, you, you know, you're really restricted for the, the, the wave and wind conditions in which you can do repairs. So we're avoiding that because the, these heavy, we don't have these heavy components. The secondary ro the rotors, the power takeoff units, the rotor and the generator weigh less than 10 tons and they are situated no higher than 25 meters above the sea. So we're avoiding a lot of costs there. Um, and uh, we've got higher reliability because it's very simple. It's just a, a rotor directly attached to a conventional generator. So there's, there's higher reliability. Um, there is an option here to make these power takeoff units detachable and replaceable uh, while taking the original to shore for, for any repairs. So um, then the, and one additional advantage is there's built in redundancy here. If one of those power takeoff units fails you, for whatever reason, you can continue to operate with the other one until um, it's a, a good opportunity to go out and, and to um, switch in a new one. So um, you, the turbine does not cease to operate uh, when one of the power takeoff units fails. So uh, in terms of those, um, oops, oh, so I beg your pardon here, I should say OPEX cost at the top. This is a similar graph to before. Uh, same comparisons. This time, the biggest savings are for the three-stage defigs um, at about you know 50% reduction in O&M costs, reducing to about 20, 25% for for direct drive permanent magnets. So, so we've identified really big potential savings in cost. So if you put the two together, capex and opex, about 20 to 25%. There's great potential from floating. For floating turbines, the overall mass is much less than a conventional hot. The center of mass and thrust is lower. Um, so the requirements, in other words, the costs from, for a floating platform and, and their anchoring systems is, is considerably reduced. 
We haven't factored that into the cost analysis, so um, it's very easily scalable. You know, um, there's some scaled versions shown in the right here. A three-bladed version with three secondary rotors, which would be 7.5 megawatts, and then with uh, two secondary rotors applied to each of these lower blades, you've got a 10 megawatt machine. So it's scalable um, uh, in a quite a straightforward manner. There's also some other ones which are interesting. That has got reduced because of the angles on the blades. There's reduced radar cross sections. Um, but the, what is really interesting, this is a very recent result that we have actually discovered that with these turbines, because of the, 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 their wake properties, there's less um, interaction between the wakes of turbines in a wind farm. We could have much higher density wind farms uh, using this type of um, turbine. Okay, so I think that, that um, that's all I really want to say. So thank you for listening. Hope he's given you some insight into what this uh, rather um, unusual type of turbine is. Now, whether um, we're going to actually, the, when we continue doing work in this, when it will turn out to be as promising as some of the potential I've indicated here. Um, well, for that, um, it, we'll just have to wait and see, but fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, for your presentation. So, okay. as I said at the beginning of the, the workshop, we are going to wrap up the session and to, to give some time for questions. Uh, I was not able to read any question on the chat, so, but I'd like to, to answer. Uh, few questions because I some of the the projects and the presentation that you gave uh, they, they they were really 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 interesting for for me from my point of view been working on some of the topics that you have been presented uh, so I like to to ask you um, Abby, I, I was able to to hear from you that do you expect around a 90 percent of the efficiency of the system when do you think but you are not able to reach no, this no, no, no. at the end of um, the project no uh, the 90 the 90 percent is the theory the theory. limit of the theory it's like the 33 percent of um, the uh, photovoltaic cells but actually um, you get much much less so uh, this limit is a physical limit. It's not the um, actual uh, uh, what we get. Okay. Get around twenty. Sorry. 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 I I I didn't want to disturb you. You are muted. The uh, practical limit. It's not. It's not a practical achievement. It's like in the um, thirty-three, the thirty-three uh, upper limit of the photovoltaic. You don't, you don't reach it. You reach maybe uh, not more than half of it. Okay. okay. Do you think that with the technology that is appearing these years and so on, uh, you will be able to improve the efficiency or the system? of your yes i, be, I believe so i believe that will it's it's like if you think about another revolution um like the um digital photography versus the uh, satellite photography in the beginning the digital ph photography you get only few a pixel per cent square centimeter but today uh, you have you have megapixels so when you start with the new technology you start at a low rate and then you you improve so we are only at the beginning not not our group but everyone everyone is trying to rectify those uh, nano antennas but today they are getting 1% 2% we are we are, we are aiming to 20 to 40 Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
And now I have a question to Jacomo, I think. Uh, I was able to to see your different picture, to show you different picture in your presentation. Someone related, uh, uh, my idea in this project is that you are not only modeling the material construction, but also some systems and so on, maybe HVAC system, lamps and so on. Because I, I was able to see a kind of component modeled or something like that. So my question is related to, to this part, the system modeling. Uh, what is the taxonomic level that you are reaching in your projects? I mean, taxonomic level, the mm -hmm. level of detail of your, of your modeling. I mean, yeah. for, for the life cycle cost, life cycle management, is this really, my, my, my question is, oriented to maintenance, maintenance actions and so on. Because for life cycle management and so on, it is important to take into account the replacement of components, parts, systems, and so on. And I wanted to know if you are taking this details into account, the level of taxonomy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the, the question. Yeah, we, we actually started from uh, the, the beam uses that you want, we want implemented in, in, in uh, Enel. So we decided uh, for what uh, we are going to use this VIM model. And uh, the, our first answer is uh, to do some, uh, to apply some beam uses that are uh, 3D coordination. So uh, clash detection during design development to do uh, code checking so uh, code checking to see if uh, the the data that uh, the data model that we defined is uh, um, is uh, 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 it's uh, um, correctly uh, implemented in the BIM object and also was about uh, uh, about uh, 5D beam user so it's to extract uh, quantities from uh, BIM models extract quantities and uh, uh, and use it to to input uh, for the the planners to to uh, to set up the the, the planner uh, the, the base uh, the baseline uh, schedule in the properly way uh, and also the last one that that you mention is uh, to do the um, o and m activities so we work with asset management we ask uh, them uh, which equipment uh, they uh, track in their system which equipment uh, are um, are uh, uh, are, um, uh, are have uh, have some activities of maintenance so this is uh, uh, the use uh, this uh, taxonomy and this uh, level of the detail to identify uh, how in, in which uh, which level of detail we have to to stop for example if asset management is not uh, tracking uh, the the uh, substitution of uh, of a screw or something like that uh, we are not or, or a bolt we are not um, designing and modeling a bolt or screw uh, bolt in 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 BIM model uh, because uh, they they didn't uh, track it in asset management activities. But they, if they track uh, the substitutions of uh, I don't know the uh, string inverter or uh, trackers or uh, PV plan uh, PV uh people panel okay so uh, we we uh we are going to uh, design to 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 uh to put a bim model for each equipment they they want to manage to 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 maintain in their uh, systems okay great it's clear for me okay thank you thank you so much all of you for your presentation and for your 
for being on time again. And I saw that Bill and, and Roman have, have left the meeting, the workshop, the session, sorry. So we can finish the, we can finish the, the session. So thank you very much for your time. Um, enjoy the, the conference, sustainable places conference. Okay. Thank you, Antonio, for moderating the um, meeting. And uh, I would like yeah. to thank all the speakers for the interesting uh, topics. Thank you very much, you all. Thank you, Antonio. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye. 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 bye.